Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this monsoon twilight morning session, or as I prefer to call it, Mornlight. Um, uh, sponsored to, brought to you by Monsoon and sponsored by FB Rice. Uh, my name's Jason Watson. I'm the um, chair of Exafarm, and also um, I have my own law firm called Elementary Law. Today we have presentations from two ASX listed companies. We have PYC Therapeutics, and that will be followed by a presentation from Genetic Signatures. Um, each presentation will run for approximately 10 minutes, and after each presenter, we will have about five minutes for Q&A relating to their presentation. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us again as, as you all come on board. And um, we will get started, firstly, with a presentation from the CEO of PYC Therapeutics, um, Sam Nasseri and PYC Therapeutics are a genetic RNA um, therapeutic company with uh, the next, next generation precision medicine. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Sam. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks very much uh, for the introduction. And hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, good evening, depending on where you might be. Uh, thanks for dialing in. And it's a pleasure to provide an introduction to PYC Therapeutics. Um, as Jason mentioned, my name is Sam Nasseri. I'm the US CEO of PYC Therapeutics, and we are a RNA therapeutics company. And we're really fueled by the question on the top left of this slide, which is how do we unlock the full potential of drugging RNA? While RNA therapeutics really have come of age over the last couple of years, not least of which, of course, the COVID vaccines, which are indeed RNA vaccines, many of them, uh, safety and delivery, efficient delivery has remained a key challenge to RNA drugs reaching their full potential. And overcoming this challenge has been the key driver of our scientific efforts at PYC in designing what we believe is a new generation of RNA therapeutics. Our technology is made up of two components. One component is designed to overcome the delivery challenge, the key challenge facing RNA therapeutics today. And the second component of our technology is the RNA therapeutic cargo itself. And taken together, uh, that is our therapeutic genetic solution that can be applied to a range of potential diseases. And we believe that this technology offers a number of benefits. You see a couple articulated on the slide here, but in particular, higher efficacy at lower doses and the potential for broad applicability to a range of tissues and cell types. Over the coming couple of slides, just over the next 10 minutes or so, I'll give you an introduction in a little bit more depth on our technology our programs and our upcoming catalysts. And it'd be a pleasure to take any questions uh, subsequent to that short presentation. To give you the highest level overview, as I've said, we're an RNA therapeutics company. This is really a new realm of precision genetic medicine, as Jason has said. Um, as I've said, our technology is made up of two components. We have applied this technology first to diseases of the eye, and then more recently expanded our discovery efforts into diseases of the CNS, specifically neurodegenerative diseases. We are a platform technology. That means essentially that we can apply our platform to a broad set of potential targets. But we've been very focused over the last 18 months in particular in leveraging this platform to design two programs in particular, which we call our two lead programs both of which would be the first disease-modifying therapies for two rare inherited retinal diseases. The first program is called VP001 for retinitis pigmentosa type 11. And the second program, funnily enough, is called VP002 for autosomal dominant optic atrophy. Both of these are diseases that are typically diagnosed in early childhood and cause patients progressive vision loss, leading to often legal blindness by around about age 40. So really uh, uh, debilitating conditions 
that today have no treatments available for patients, nothing in the clinic. And so really important unmet needs. We also estimate that both of these programs represent blockbuster market opportunities. That is greater than 1 billion US dollars per annum in potential market opportunity for these programs as we drive them through the clinic and into market. We are around 12 months from clinical development for the VP001 program. We're about six months behind that for the VP002 program. Uh, and we're anticipating filing an IND, an investigational new drug application with the FDA uh, in the middle of next year to support moving that VP001 program into the clinic. As we think about the next couple of weeks and months, there's several key milestones for us of great importance. One being readouts from our large animal primate and rabbit studies, which those studies are ongoing. We anticipate sharing outcomes from those studies in the coming couple of weeks and months. Those are critical readouts to answer the question of tolerability in particular. We've already really answered the question of efficacy for our drug candidate BP001 in the context of our mouse and patient derived models. So those large animal results are really what stands between us and moving into the clinic. So critical readouts in the coming couple of weeks and months. We also anticipate in the coming couple of months sharing additional pipeline programs, both in the eye and in the CNS as we expand application of our technology into new areas. We are a company that is operating across Australia where we have our discovery and laboratory operations but also the United States where I am here in San Diego as part of Johnson & Johnson's J Labs incubator here where we were selected to join that incubator where we're building all of our formal preclinical, regulatory and clinical development muscle um, as well as some of our corporate activities to complement the terrific discovery hub we have in Australia. You can see a snapshot here of our executive leadership team and board, which is really built, as I've mentioned, across Australia and the US. Our chief scientific officer, Professor Sue Fletcher and Dr. Rowan Hawkins really lead our discovery hub and operations in Australia. Professor Fletcher is a terrific world leading pioneer in RNA therapeutics, having co-invented three now commercialized RNA therapeutics. So we lean heavily on her and her team in the design and development of our RNA drugs. We design nucleic acid by nucleic acid, these RNA drug cargos, which we then conjugate to our peptides to support delivery of those RNA drugs into the cells of interest. And you can see then on the US side, we've been building out a team, both at the leadership team level and at the board to bring complementary skill sets and experience into the company. RNA therapeutics are really an important new area of medicine. They've been around for some time, but over the last years, we've seen a real coming of age of a number of different modalities under the broad umbrella of RNA therapeutics. And you can see on this slide here, the growth in value of public RNA focused companies in the United States, both the growth in value, but also the growth in number of companies in particular over the last few years, as we've seen more and more clinical and indeed commercial validation of these modalities. And what that's resulted in is really the largest step up of investment in this modality of all time in both public and private companies over the last 12 months. It really is a coming of age. And when you think about that, as well as the fact that delivery has been the key challenge for this field, PYC is really well placed to capitalize on the market momentum while having a solution that overcomes that key challenge. You can see here our market cap as compared to some of our peers in the United States. This is certainly an aspiration for us. We have a really strong market cap and position that has grown really meaningfully over the last 18 months as we've progressed our programs with real focus over the last 18 months, as I mentioned, but we still see a two to three X gap to where we'd like to be as compared to some of our US peers at similar stages of development and also in the RNA therapeutic space. Oftentimes we get asked as a preclinical company, 
um, how do you see valuations so high? Well, that's sp specific to the fact that we're in the realm of precision medicine. And what we're able to do in this realm is take a lot more risk out in the drug development journey early through our preclinical models than in standard drug development journeys. And that just gives us a higher probability of success as we enter the clinic in ultimately being able to generate a drug that meets the market. You can see on this slide, our pipeline, we have three formal preclinical development candidates uh, for three different ocular diseases at this time, a ton of discovery efforts, both in the eye and the CNS that we're excited about. I'll give you one data slide um, and no more as part of this short presentation. This is from our VP001 program for retinitis pigmentosa type 11. It's really quite remarkable what we've been able to show here. What you see on the left-hand side of this slide is a healthy RPE cells under a scanning electron microscope, an SEM image of RPE cells. RPE cells are the cells right at the back of your retina. So you can see the healthy cells, what they look like here. In the middle, you see those cells, but this time from a patient with retinitis pigmentosa type 11. So you see significant destruction in those critical retinal pigment epithelium RPE cells. And you see after then on the right-hand side, after a single dose of our drug, VP001, of our RNA therapeutic, you see a really significant and nice correction of the structural deficiency. That is actually one of the critical causes of vision loss in retinitis pigmentosa type 11 patients. This preclinical model gives us a lot of confidence that our drug is able to resolve the disease, modify the disease and help patients to ultimately see for longer, which is a really important impact that we can have. Um, I will just call out before I wrap up here, we've got a number of key milestones upcoming. I've talked about our larger animal studies for VP001. This is the the, the boxes in blue here. We have those studies underway currently in primates, and rabbits. We'll be sharing those data out in the coming couple of weeks um, and months. Critical readouts for us in progression of that program into the final step of preclinical development before we then file IND in the middle of next year. We do anticipate beyond those readouts though, additional readouts in our subsequent ocular programs but also in expansion of our pipeline into the CNS and additional ocular programs over the coming couple of months as we expand the application of our platform technology. And with that, Jason, I might pause in case there are any questions at this time. Thank you, Sam. Um, please use the Q&A function or the chat function on your screens uh, and type if you have any questions. So we have nearly 60 participants. So um, you might want to get in quick. Um, as they came come through, I had a, an initial question around the um, J and J Lab and that that collaboration. Does that does that mean that you have a form of deal with them or another form of collaboration? How, how does that work? No, we were so there's no formal collaboration with J and J. They invited us to join J Labs, which is their kind of biotech incubator in San Diego. We're here with another 40 other biotech companies selected by J and J. There, of course, is a lot of business development activity that we're undertaking in the United States, including with J and J. And typically, they would only select companies in which they have an interest in deeper collaboration and engagement. And we're looking at all of those options and working on those pathways um, as we speak. Great. Um, not seeing any questions here. So um, we'll just pause for a minute to see if any, any come in. Otherwise we'll, we'll move on in a second. No problem. Oh, we have one. Um, so there's a question from Andrew Gibbons as to what as a business is your greatest threat in, in, <laughs> in three minutes or less? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. And oftentimes when people ask that question, they are thinking of 
other technologies such as gene therapies, AAV gene therapies, viral mediated delivery gene therapies, for example. Um, I often don't see other biotechs, frankly, as competitors, but rather peers. There are so many diseases that have a genetic root that have no solution for patients today that it is a good thing to have multiple technologies, multiple shots on goal driving towards the clinic. That said, um, we're very careful in selecting indications for which we truly are differentiated. And for the critical programs that we've selected and prioritized, um, we don't see key uh, competitors that we don't think we have differences to, meaningful differences to, in the context of our particular technology and program. So a lot of thought goes into our indication selection as we think about choosing and prioritizing programs to uh, develop behind. So I like to think of our biotech uh, community as peers rather than competitors, because there's so much unmet need that it's a good thing for patients ultimately to have multiple approaches progressing. Um, I have a couple of other questions and then we, we might close it off after that. Um, a question from David Sitzma as to what is your probability of success on each program now? Um, and I'll roll in the other question as well. Um, a question from Brian Gilbert as to uh, will you release rabbit and monkey results at different times? So I'll let you great, answer. Uh, question, great question. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'll answer the second one first and I'll come back to the first one. Uh, the large animal studies, as I've said in my presentation, are really key catalysts for the progression of our programs. We will be looking to release those data as we get them over the coming couple of weeks and months. It's likely that we'll see data from our rabbit studies first and then subsequently from our primate studies. Um, both are critical readouts in the context of progression of the programs. Of course, the primates are typically seen as the gold standard model as we look to translate our programs into the clinic, but we'll be looking to share those over the coming couple of weeks um, and months as we progress. And I think we've said that we'll make an announcement around those in the third quarter first and then in the early fourth quarter uh, for the broader and more comprehensive set of results. On the question of probability of success, again, a really good question and an important one in the context of precision genetic medicines, because this is the point I was making during the presentation. Because of the very precise nature of our medicines, and the well understood biology of the genetic targets and the diseases that we're going after, you actually take a lot more risk out of our development journey early as compared to standard drug development. And so we find for genetic medicines, oftentimes you see a 5x improvement in probability of success as compared to other therapeutic developments, even at that kind of preclinical or getting into the clinic stage. So we see a very significantly increased probability of success for our therapeutics as compared to standard drug development. Standard drug development, you often see a kind of 10% probability of success once you enter the clinic. Um, I would be imagining multiples of that at the current stage that we find ourselves. Thank you. That's probably a good spot to uh, wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Sam, and thank you, PYC Therapeutics. Um, uh, ASX ticker code PYC if you're interested. Um, thank you for joining us and for your presentation. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone. Next up, we'll move to um, John Melky, who's the CEO of Genetic Signatures. Um, uh, Genetic Signatures have a molecular is a is a molecular diagnostic company uh, with precise rapid diagnostics for infectious diseases. So. We'll hand over to John, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, it's, it's easy to get tongue tied on molecular diagnostics, but thanks, thanks for the intro. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's always a, a pleasure to, to tell you about um, genetic signatures and our, uh, our company, our successes to date. So I'll launch straight into uh, our summary. We are an established company. We've been listed for six and a half years, but we were founded some 20 years ago. Uh, we are focused on the commercialization of our unique technology. It's called 3Base and its application to rapid and accurate detection 
of infectious diseases. So these are the microorganisms that make us sick. Some of them have quite a high mortality rate. And 3Base was developed as a way to simplify the detection of these microorganisms. Um, they allow us to design, to develop, manufacture, we sell, support these kits to pathology labs who use these kits on patient material, patient samples that come through the door every day. And these are available um, in most of global markets. We've been selling them for the last 10 years with year on year growth during that time. We have achieved record sales revenue uh, in the year that just closed of over 28 million, which is a 151% increase over the prior year. We have a four year CAGR of 93%, uh, as I said, with labs around the world using us every day. The sales model is very straightforward. We sell our kits to testing laboratories. They are generally mid to high throughput facilities. They're hospital laboratories or private pathology suppliers who in turn use our kits on the patient material that comes in. They pay us on standard 30 day terms. So time from sale to cash is pretty quick. And the lab itself is reimbursed through government subsidies for every test that they perform. Importantly, once the customer has established a workflow, it becomes like a printer ink cartridge type of model. So we sell them our tests to use their consumables on their instruments and they're often genetic signatures branded instruments. So these tests have led to uh, us being profitable. We have 30 million in cash and, uh, and no debt. We have a number of kits with, with regulatory registrations and that's in multiple jurisdictions. We have more kits coming through the development and commercialization pathways. So we now have a footprint in Australia, in Europe, in the US, and with many repeat sales to each of those labs, I can confidently say that 3Base is a tried and proven technology uh, in use every day. So the tests that we produce are what is known as syndromic panels or syndromic screening, and it allows labs to test for a broad range of clinically relevant pathogens. And these are based on patient symptoms. So we all know respiratory symptoms can be a sore throat, could be a runny nose. It, it might be influenza, it could be rhinovirus, it could be a mild coronavirus, it could be a serious one like SARS-CoV-2. And our genetic signatures, three base tests, are able to look for all of these and more in the, effectively the one patient sample in the one test. They are molecular tests, they are PCR tests, which are the kind of tests that detect the genetic information. And three base is an addition to that. Um, the technology is quite clever, we actually changed the DNA alphabet before we detect the organism. So the C letter, we changed to a T letter. And the reason we do that is just to remove the variability that you see between strains. And the best way I can explain that is to think of something like influenza and the different type of strains that we know exist. They're like bird flu, swine flu, pandemic flu. They're all very similar, but they do all have slightly different different genetic sequences. So because we alter that sequence, we're better able to detect all of those subtypes. And further to that, our three base technology is actually resistant to the mutations that we know occur every day in microbial genomes, because that C letter that we changed to a T letter, it is the most unstable letter, and it does change from C to T in nature. And it happens quite uh, frequently. And so all of those mutations are invisible to us. And we can therefore detect all of known variants and COVID is a great example that we can detect alpha, beta, gamma, um, delta, et cetera. Um, and 99% of them are a perfect match. So on the right hand side of this slide, you can see the kits that we sell up the top, but also I wanna point out those genetic signatures branded instruments that we sell, because that's quite important um, as they're revenue generating. They're the printer in the printer and cartridge model. And, Really importantly, we have quadrupled the number of these instruments that we have in the field over the last 18 months. As the revenue generating, as we now have a broader install base uh, over the last 18 months, and that's been fueled by the pandemic, but it's also been fueled by Genetic Signature's ability to develop a three base PCR based test for SARS-CoV-2 early in the pandemic. And three minutes, Workflows uh, have patent, uh, patents issued, which, which expire uh, out to 2031. 
So last thing I'll say is that we've worked very hard to make sure all of our tests work in exactly the same way. So once we release a new test, these can be easily integrated into existing workflows, but also opens doors to new customers. And our, our increasing revenues really reflect that. As you can see on this slide here, graphically, very easy to see the two and a half times increase in annual revenue uh, that we achieved for FY21 and that four year CAGR of 93%. Importantly, international revenue was 21% of our total revenue, and that's reflective of the inroads that we are making into the offshore markets, which we're really focused on at the moment. Demand for our products remains strong. We did announce in our uh, June quarterly that the month of July had achieved over $4 million worth of sales, and that's very significant when you think that 4.2 million is our fifth biggest best quarter to date. So we're very well positioned to leverage the gains that we've made over the last 18 months, fourfold increase in the number of instruments, and they will continue to generate revenue for us. We were profitable in financial year 21. Uh, we had 1.8 million, uh, and that was against the 28.3 million in sales, and we were cash flow uh, positive on an operating basis, and that was by 3.7 million compared to actually an outflow of 9.5 million last financial year. So closing with 30 million in cash allows us to continue to execute these expansion plans with, with, with confidence. This slide's important as it shows the kits that we have in development. And I really like to point out that the majority of our revenue is from those top two products. So respiratory has been fueled by the pandemic, but gastrointestinal also is our most mature product, which we've been selling for over, over seven years. The importance is that we have seven additional products that either have come through the regulatory pathway or are coming through the development pathway. And you need, if you remember that these tests all work in exactly the same way on compatible instruments already in the field, which is why we are very excited and focused on completing development and commercialization of these additional products. I will just reiterate here that these are full panels. So each of these looks for 10 or 15 or 20 microorganisms in the one patient sample. So the example I gave uh, on respiratory, our, our full respiratory screen can look for 14 types of respiratory infections. So remember those symptoms and they could be flu or rhino or whatever, we can look for all of those. And we also look for SARS-CoV-2 obviously. And these kits have regulatory approvals, they're ready to go, which is why we're really very excited about our future. It's really important too, as we transition out of the pandemic, because the pandemic was very focused on looking for SARS-CoV-2 in symptomatic patients. And as we transition back to a normal situation where multiple infections can cause the same respiratory symptoms, we're in a very good position uh, to supplement uh, our existing customers and introduce new customers. If I turn now to the strategy, our uh, expansion strategy, uh, we're targeting North America and Europe. The US is our largest international market. It does have 40% of the world's testing revenue coming from the US. In the US, we are direct. We have, it um, in terms of sales and support, we do have a distributor in Canada and we have entry into the US market with our SARS-CoV-2 detection kit. But I am most excited by our entry preparation for our enteric protozoan kit, which will become our first FDA cleared product. We are aspiring to win 40% market share there, and I'll come back to that in just, just a moment. We've made good inroads into Europe over the last 12 months. It's often difficult circumstances. We are direct there in the UK and Germany. We have a good pipeline of opportunities, and we, we have appointed distributors in other key countries. So a number of sites are using us there for COVID screening. Uh, but as I just said, we have other kits with regulatory clearance in Europe and we have just finished trials for our enteric product, for example. So we can see that transition starting to occur. Australia is our home base. We are, in direct, we are direct with sales and support. It's where we manufacture all of our goods, good penetration into New South Wales and Victoria. We have recently signed up a new lab in Queensland. And it's quite significant as Australia is one of the most competitive, lean, efficient markets uh, in terms of IV, IVD. 
So I said I'd come back to the enteric protozoan just briefly to walk you through uh, the assumptions that we've made. This is our enteric protozoan kit. We think we've identified a gap in the market where we can displace traditional tests, which really look down, traditional tests look down the microscope and try and identify parasites in their cysts. So we know that there are about five and a half million of these traditional tests performed in the US each year and we're aspiring to win 40% of that in the next five years, remembering that we're targeting high throughput applications. Price is still to be set, but on the bottom left there, you can see that pricing of 20 to $40 uh, can, can actually generate for us between 22 and 88 million US dollars per, per annum. So I will just um, briefly talk about the investment summary. Uh, we, we have um, a market capitalization of about 240 million. Uh, we do have um, uh, Asia Union as a majority holder on the register, Christopher Abbott, who did support us for 15 years prior to listing, uh, and obviously happy to have perennial fidelity on the register. Um, I'll just finish up briefly um, by looking forward, and I do hope it's quite clear now that we do have multiple growth opportunities. We are very focused really on three things. It's just securing those long-term customer contracts, and these are high throughput, high value contracts. We delight our customers with our service who in turn are references for our next new customer. We are secondly focused on upselling, as I mentioned, to those new customers that we've gained over the last 18 months, remembering the kits work in exactly the same way. And finally, we are focused on developing and commercializing those new products that are outlined and especially excited by our FDA uh, trials that are ongoing now for FDA clearance for our protozoan kit. I'll just close by saying we are working on a next generation instrument. I told you about our instruments. This, I believe, will be a game changer. It will allow users to load a patient sample onto an instrument. The instrument will do the entire run and report the results back into the hospital computer segment. And this will give us access to new market se uh, segments uh, as that instrument comes through. So I'm happy to pause there for any questions. Um, our, um, our contact details are on the screen there, should that be helpful. Thank you, John. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, I'll be less tongue-tied if I could read my own handwritten notes. I should stick to uh, <laughs> typing. Um, uh, typing, if you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A function. Um, we had one previously submitted question, John, uh, which you largely dealt with as to when you expect to break even, um, which you've covered in profitability. Um, just to add to that, do you see the profitability continuing to grow and whether with Australian manufacturing, whether lockdowns have had any impact on that? Yeah, look, lock, lockdowns um, have impacted um, our ability, but we moved very quickly early in the pandemic to secure a month's worth of stock. So um, we preferred it in our warehouse than, uh, than in somebody else's warehouse. So we did move quite quickly. Um, the question was on profitability, and yes, we were profitable as our outline. Um, in terms of where that's heading, um, it's obviously contingent in the very short term uh, on the COVID testing. Um, I, I, uh, I think that um, I outlined the transition that's happening now from just pure COVID testing into full respiratory screening and all the other kits that we have for sales. So um, we're, we're very um, excited by that and transitioning out of this period for multiple reasons. The effect that's having on human health, obviously, <laughs> primarily, but also that we can get back to our core business, which is syndromic screening. Thank you. We have a question from David as to what percentage of 2021 revenue could be attributed to the COVID uplift? Um, it so historically, the gastroenteritis was our most mature product and therefore um, was the biggest component of our revenue. The pandemic did switch that. We did have respir significant respiratory revenues, but obviously the pandemic has shifted that where respiratory has become our primary, uh, the majority of our revenue. Uh, but we do see and are seeing the other testing uh, increase again, um, especially offshore where the restrictions are lifting. And we expect to see that here in Australia too. Once those restrictions ease, more people are going out and therefore we will see demand for the other products come back to pre-pandemic levels as we continue to introduce new kits into the marketplace. We 
<clears throat> have a question from Tim Borham. Um, the question that's on a few people's minds at the moment. Um, are, you, are you confident that the TGA will be directed by the government to allow rapid COVID testing? And if so, when? Oh, I, <laughs> I, I don't dare speak about what the TGA and the government and what they might allow, but um, I'm, I think I'm on record of saying that there's a place for every type of test. And that is a rapid test, which might not have the accuracy and the sensitivity of a PCR test. Um, but each one of these tests does have its place. So in the absence of a PCR test, a rapid test makes sense, but there's a, there's a whole host of issues on home testing or testing at work that need to be worked through. Yeah, good, thank you. Well answered. Um, it's an yeah, interesting area at the moment. Um, I'll just pause for a minute and see if we have any other questions. If not, we'll wrap up. No, nothing further. Um, good. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, thank you for everyone for joining us today and for your questions. Um, genetic signatures is GSS uh, ASX code, if you're interested. And uh, John shared his contact details with everyone. So thanks for that. And um, just in wrapping up, I'd like to thank uh, Monsoon and Rudy and the team for organising the event and also to FB Rice for sponsoring. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, enjoy your days. Thanks, bye.